Hey guys, we're back on Emacs and uh, this time we'll be talking about Emacs Lisp. So I prepared a little org file that we'll go through again when examining this. And this is going to be just an introduction again, I'll, I'll talk about configuration. Uh, there is a nice little package that I found that's very fancy if you're thinking of writing kind of Lisp on your own. And uh, we'll also go again through some of the ways that you can use it. So uh, first things first, the introduction, you have kind of three main ways to run kind of Emacs Lisp. So the first thing you can do is you can use an Emacs Lisp buffer. So an example of such a buffer is uh, the scratch buffer. So in fact, if I open it, you notice that this is in Lisp interaction mode. So I essentially get kind of the Lisp uh, regular key bindings. So I am also using par edit as a middle, as a minor mode and check and check this out. So whenever I input that parentheses, it actually automatically inserts the corresponding parentheses. So this is very nice behavior again, and I'll show you how to explain this, in, uh, how to kind of use this in a while. But let's say that I want to kind of print something to the echo area. You already know that I have a function for that, which is called message. And uh, this is printed to the echo area is going to be the string that I want to print. Now, to evaluate this inside of a Lisp, uh, inside of a Lisp mode buffer, I can go to the end of the expression. And it is important that I go to the end because the command that I use is evaluate last expression, which is bound to control X, control E. And this evaluates again the last expression before the cursor. So I do need to go to the, this last parentheses here to the left and notice that I get the output. If I were to kind of use this command in the middle of the, of the line, you notice that I get a Lisp error because this is a void variable again. So it's trying to treat this as a variable because it doesn't understand again that I have more stuff to come after the cursor. This is one way to run Lisp code. You also have ielm, which is essentially the Elisp repo. So that is built into, into kind of Emacs, meta x ielm, and you get the same environment. So par edit also works here. So I get the corresponding parentheses and except that it's kind of buggy so this is not replay uh, removing them but let's try running the message function from here and you notice that i get the return value which is the string but i also get the side effect which is be things being printed to the echo area a third way of doing this is by using a org mode buffer so we already saw that you can define source code inside of org mode by using this and then if i set it to emacs lisp i can type in something so the same thing for example message this gets printed except that you notice that if i use Control c Control c to execute here this does not i don't get the side effects well only i the, the only thing that i get is kind of the the return value so this is the return value for that it happens that on the case of the message statement it not only returns the string but it also prints the string to the echo area you notice that i don't get anything printed down here but uh, i do get the uh, the return value We'll be kind of doing a mixture of both. I'll be trying to show this from one org buffer so that it's easier to follow along. Now, regarding configuration, this, uh, the behavior that gets my kind of, uh, that nice behavior with the automatic uh, balancing of parentheses is done by par edit. So this is the snippet of code. This is also on my GitHub, so you can just clone the repo. And it's going to be under, I, mean, I can even show you, it's going to be under, dot emacs dot d mine dot org is going to be under lisp stuff so if you want you can just uh, copy this piece of code here with regards to variables and functions so we'll, we'll kind of t uh, talk about some more advanced uh, some more basic rather uh, lisp things uh, right now and then in future episodes we can get into the more advanced stuff so you kind of have variables in Lisp. You also have strings and numbers as usual. So 42 in this context is going to be a symbol. And this symbol evaluates to the integer 42. So if I press Control C, Control C here, I am evaluating it and I get the return value 42. So essentially 42 is a symbol, as I was saying. And uh, I can also do the same thing for strings. So for example, this is a string. Strings, they are defined just as they are in other languages. So by using the double quotes and then control C, control C, notice that I get the return value. This is a string. And I can also call variables. So in fact, let's say that I, I happen to know from reading the manual that there is this one var variable built into Emacs, which is called fill column. 
And uh, if you want documentation on any variable, you can you always have the command control H and then V. And uh, notice that again, since I uh, since I'm top of the word, I actually get uh, suggested the word itself. So I'll go with fill column as the as the description. And this is again kind of a documentation on the variable if you're interested. Now let's say that I execute this, I actually get back seventy because it happens that the fill column variable on my Emacs is uh, equal to seventy. And uh, Lisp also has functions, and functions they are kind of the main part of Lisp because Lisp itself is a pro is a functional programming language, and really a lot of the kind of uh, behavior relies on functions doing things. So you're not going to see classes, you're not going to be to see object oriented programming. Everything relies on uh, kind of uh, functions, and the functions they are defined whenever you open a parenthesis. So if I were to start opening a parenthesis here, and then I write in something, for example, anything, so if I let's just say that the first thing that I'll do is I'll try to use an invalid function. So let's say that I want to um, sum two numbers. So this would be the incorrect way of summing two numbers, in fact, because uh, essentially the first thing on a parenthesis is going to be the function, and then you give it arguments. So this is something that's anti-intuitive if, if you're used to other languages, but this is how Lisp works. So if I try evaluating this. I actually get the response invalid function 42 because it's expecting the plus to be here, in fact, to be on the beginning. But if I do it like this, I can execute this and you notice that I get the output 84, which is 42 plus 42. Now I can mix and match functions and I can also give uh, the return of other functions to the two functions. So for example, if I wanted, I could also make uh, 42 times two and then sum this with 42. So uh, the Lisp reader, it's very intelligent in that it parses the list accordingly and it knows that it needs to evaluate this part of the code first and then it evaluates this part of the code first and then it evaluates the whole thing. So if I run that, I get 126, which supposedly is also 42 times three. So because 42 plus 42 plus 42. And again, so mathematical functions, they are very simple. You have plus and you have uh, times, you have minus also. So 42 minus two plus 42, this is going to be 82. And you can also divide. So 42 divided by two is going to be 21. And then plus 32, and then plus 42, you get 63. You can also define lists in uh, Emacs Lisp. And uh, the difference is that you also use the parentheses, but you can quote the parentheses. And there are two syntaxes for that. So if I execute this, I actually get returned a list. And org mode, in this case, it kind of displays the list as if it were the row of a table. Just know that this is represented uh, inside of Emacs. I can even open this on a ELIST buffer. This is represented like this by using the parentheses. So this is a list. And there, this is one of the ways you can also define lists by using the list function. So if I write in list and then I give uh, and then I give it arguments one, two, three, four, for example, I can then execute this piece of code and I get returned again a list which contains the items one, two, three, four. You can also talk about truth values. So there are two kind of truth values in uh, Emacs Lisp and uh, they are nil and t. So these are kind of the equivalent, the analogous rather. They are the analogous versions of uh, true and false. So nil, in fact, is a placeholder for an empty list. So anything that's not an empty list is going to be considered to have a truth value of true, in fact. So t is a placeholder for anything that's not an empty list. And I can even check this by using this little function, which is called equal. And equal is a function that uh, essentially compares things and it tells us if they are weak, equal and if they are of the same type. So uh, if I run this, you'll notice that is nil, is nil equal to an empty list? And the result is yes. Is t or true equal to an empty list? I'm going to receive nothing because by default, org mode does not print uh, kind of nil. So if I go to my, again, to my e list buffer, I can press control X, control E. And you notice that I get nil as an output because true is not equal to an empty list. You also have some fancy little functions when it comes to Lisp. 
So one of the most important is set queue, and this allows you to kind of set variables. So as an example here, I'm using set queue, and I'm setting it to a variable to be the integer 42. And here I'm setting a string. So again, a string is equal to the string. So the first thing, the first item is always going to be the symbol that you're attaching the kind of um, the value to, and this is the value. We call these uh, symbols, by the way. So these names that we give to stuff, they are symbols. And I can use the message function in order to print that, as we were talking earlier. And the uh, message is very nice because it works kind of like a they print f function in C. So you can give it kind of this uh, this placeholder. This is a placeholder for an integer, the percent %d. And this is a placeholder for a string. So this is essentially the same uh, syntax that you use for a format uh, statement, for example. And then you give it kind of the arguments that you put placeholders for. So I put a placeholder for the integer first, so I'm giving it a variable. And then I put a placeholder for the string, and then I give it a string. If I execute this, I get this nice output. You'll notice that I also have a little uh, backslash n, and this is a jump to the next line. So this is why there is a jump from here to here. And uh, a variable equal 42, my string equals to a string. So this is what set queue does. It essentially assigns values, values or lists to symbols. I also have let, and let is kind of a nice statement that essentially defines the scope within which a variable is defined. So in this case, I'm using let, and I do need this kind of outer, uh, outer parentheses, and then inside of it, I can give these kind of uh, lists in pairs. So this one is going to, uh, this part is going to assign my header to the value. This is a header. And then my delimiter is going to be assigned this kind of string. And my footer is going to be assigned, this is my food. This is my footer. And inside of this let statement, these three variables, they are defined. And I can use them, for example, on a message statement. And then the message statement, it's using the concat function, which stands for concatenate. So if I give it a number of strings, it essentially is going to concatenate them one after another. And if I try this, so I'm putting all of my three variables in order, I can execute this code and you notice that I get the output. So this is a header and then I jump to the next line and then I print my delimiter and then I jump to the next line and then I print my footer. If I were to try to use these variables outside of the let statement, they will not be they will not be defined. So I can even try that. I can use message my header just to, so that I can print this is a header and let's see if that works. So if I execute this again, you notice symbols va symbols value as variable is void because again I am outside of the scope of this variable. So the Lisp compiler, the Lisp reader does not understand that this variable is defined out here. You can also define functions by using this kind of defund function. And the syntax is very simple. So you define the function name, again, that you're at. This is the function symbol. And uh, then you give it a list of arguments inside of this kind of, uh, this kind of parentheses. So here I have a first argument. And you notice that we usually kind of separate things using dashes. So this is the most, uh, I would say, uh, the most used way. And this is the best practice also. So we also have a second argument and uh, usually function definitions, they come uh, with this index and I can also write doc string. So whichever string I write, I write right after the, this kind of parentheses is going to become the doc string for my function. And the doc string is what appears in the manual. So in this sense, uh, Emacs Lisp is kind of self-documenting because uh, whichever, whatever you write as a kind of commentary here, pseudo commentary anyway, is going to appear on the menu of the function directly. So you write code together with documentation. And in this case, what this function does, so it defines the arguments, it defines the doc string, and then the next thing that you do is you, you essentially give it the instructions to evaluate. So in this case, the instructions are use the message function and then concatenate the first argument and the second argument. So in this case, I'm supposing that the first argument and the second argument, they are strings because I can concatenate them and because I can print them. And later, I can call this function as I would any other function. So I open parentheses, and then the first thing that I call is my function. And then I give it two strings. So this is the first argument, and this is the second argument. 
And if I execute this, the function is defined and then I call it and this is what it outputs. So baby's first Lisp tutorial, notice that it's concatenating. This is my first argument and then it got concatenated with the second one and then it got printed. Finally, you have a nice function which is called interactive and you can put it inside of your def of your defined function statements. So as an example, this is an interactive function and I define here a two liner to be my doc string. You notice that I just need to put my uh, my my kind of documentation inside of this uh, little uh, set of uh, double quotes. And then what is important is that right before starting my my uh, my expressions, I can then use the interactive keywords. Notice that this time there is no, there are no arguments. So this function is going to be called interactively, which means that essentially I can call it using a meta x command. So if I evaluate this as a return value, I get kind of the symbol that I am defining. And now the function is callable from my Emacs. So if I press meta x and then my interactive function, you notice that I get hello YouTube printed down here. And additionally, I can also refer to the documentation of it. So if I go over my interactive function and press control H F, you notice that my interactive function is available. So in fact, the doc string that I defined here is what appears here on the manual. Now, this is, I think, a good, a good beginning in terms of Lisp. We haven't touched on kind of control statements or anything else. Uh, we looked a bit how to kind of define variables and also how to define functions as well as lists. And uh, again, if you guys are interested, just uh, drop a comment and I'll make more videos kind of uh, in this uh, in this sub part of the series regarding Emacs Lisp. Uh, I do like it a lot and uh, I think it's very fun to write Emacs Lisp at the end of the day. So really, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.